And today's webinar, we're talking about all the basics that are required to get websites working. Um, so we've been doing a lot of strategy work recently. So now we're actually going to be in the nuts and bolts of uh, getting websites working. Uh, and also, I always introduce the uh, webinars with um, talking about the background uh, picture. So the background behind me is by a company called Blank Canvas. And they're a Melbourne-based company. They're literally a few blocks that way from where I live. Um, and they're doing amazing work. Um, and you may know them from White Knight. So this actual um, large-scale puppets here are from White Knight. And they did quite a lot of White Knight's um, puppetry last year. So they were a really, really beautiful company. Um, and I really like to support artists. Um, so in that context, um, when things get going and you see them about, then I go support their work and their shows. The other thing, sorry, um, is the run sheet. So I'm running off the run sheet. Now this is a little bit different because I've, I've had this content um, written up, some of it written up for uh, previous resources. And I've just been updating it a bit today and I've been adding a few things. So some things are, are complete as in a written resource and some things aren't. So I'm just gonna you know, run through them as I would a run sheet. So the first thing I want to do is look at the basic website setup. Um, so this is a basic concept of what we'll be looking at today. Um, this diagram here, and so you can also open it up as a PDF. So yeah, so before we build any uh, websites or set up our email, and this is irrelevant of what software you're using, whether you're using WordPress or Squarespace or you know, any of the other million apps stuff there. This is the basics of like all websites and all technology. So yeah, we're really looking at the basics to underline it. Um, so this diagram is a little bit helpful in this context. Um, and I'll be going through this in a bit more detail, but uh, do refer back to this because as I'm starting to talk about details, you can sort of see how it fits in. So the first uh, concept is that we want to register your domain with the registrar. And also during this presentation, I am going to use jargon. I usually try to not use jargon um, during my talks, but it's important because these are the actual words of what things are called. So if, I, if I'm using like different language, then it'll get confusing really quick when you're trying on tech support, trying to get help with something. So I will be using the jargon um, and try and explain it. So, so we register your domain, then we delegate your domain to your host. And then your host will have uh, various tools which will allow you to set up your website. That includes your website, your email and software. So uh, this may be a bit of a um, mouthful and eyeful at the moment, but I'm hoping by the end of the webinar, this will all make sense. I'm gonna go through now in detail. So yeah, refer back to this. Maybe you have that up on your screen so you can see it. Um, so first I'm gonna start is what is a domain? And a domain name is, is the address of your website. So this is the phys physical, well, the digital address that someone types into a browser, they'll end up at your website. So this is a really key part of your um, website. Obviously it's the uh, address. And the internet actually works by numbers. And so there's a system IP numbers and addresses. So there's a system that will sync up your domain name with your numbers. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so let's have a look at what a domain uh, looks like. I'm, I'm sharing screen, so uh, you can either, re if it's clear on your Zoom, um, that's good, so you can just follow me. But if it's not clear, then you can also get these run sheets up on your laptop um, or on your desktop. So here are the components. So this will make sense to you. Um, you would have seen these a lot. Um, HTTP, www.customname.com. So I'm just going to break down what those bits are. The HTTP, uh, semicolon forward slash forward slash. So this is a bit of internet protocol or a bit of code protocol. And what that means is it tells other software and including browsers that this is an, an address on the internet. So if you've got an address with that at the start of it in your email, your email program knows that if someone clicks on it, it knows, oh, this is a web address. So therefore I open up the web browser and then I go to that address. So all web addresses will start with HTTP semicolon forward slash that are in a browser. Now browsers are starting and if you look at my browser up the top here, you'll see that they're starting to hide it. So this action skills up here and that's just because they're a bit ugly. But if you click on it, um, then it'll reveal the full uh, HTTPS. So all, all web addresses on the internet will be using this protocol. 
Now, another um, addition to this protocol is the S. So then we get HTTPS semicolon forward slash forward slash. Now the S means that there's this SSL certificate or secure socket layer. Now all that means in English is it means that it's encrypted and it's a, it's a secure system. So this means that it encrypts between where your website is hosted your, and the user's browser. It's encrypted in between. So that's really key. Like if you're typing in credit card details, you want to make sure that that data is encrypted and can't, can't be intercepted. So if you're doing anything with sensitive data or credit cards, then it's mandatory and it's law to be using um, HTTPS. Now, most credit card software simply won't work over HTTP. HTTP. Um, now, it's also best practice for all websites to be using HTTPS and the internet's starting to move across to implementing it. What's happening is in uh, Google started to signal that it's going to start de-ranking websites that don't have the um, S and also browsers are starting to make a bit more fuss and it's going to phase in over time. So you can see up here, there's a padlock on my browser um, saying that HTTPS is in um, and as versions of browsers, that's going to start being more, when it doesn't have an S, it's just going to make, you know, be bright red or, or, or signal that this is an unsafe website. WWW is um, a bit of an old protocol and before we had the, it stands for World Wide Web and this is what we know now as the internet or the, the well, what we know as the internet. But before um, the World Wide Web became the default, there was other protocols, Gopher, Telnet, I think some other, I mean, I'm too old to actually know, too young even to know what they are. But um, the that was what used to differentiate them. So now it's not, not needed. So the www is not actually needed in a web address. So I actually don't add them. I think that it's um, old fashioned and it's clunky and it just adds too much um, room to your domain. So if we look up here, I don't actually, it's far better just to have the, the domain name right without the W. Some websites need that www for technical reasons, but that'd be more advanced than what we're going through today. Um, and sometimes if I'm printing something, like if I'm printing it on a poster, I might put www on the web address so that people understand that it's a website because people, I mean, it looks a lot better than the HTTP, um, right? Okay, so the next bit is the custom bit. So the custom name. So this is whatever you want your domain to be. So in my case, mine's action skills. Uh, and that's the, the, the key bit is choosing your domain and the .com, this is technically of the, of the web address, the actual part that is technically called the domain. Uh, in this context, it's called the top level domain. And uh, so like .com.au is called a second level domain because it's got .com.au. So there's two parts of it. Um, and and uh, .com is just a top level domain. So they're the components of a domain name, a website address. They can represent things, countries, organizations, etc. So .net, .com, .org are the oldest ones and they're the easiest to register. .com.au are for Australian brands and organizations. And there are quite a few other um, Australian domains available. There's .asn.au, for example. And the, the Australian um, organization that manages it is bringing in new domains and I think they're looking at dropping the .com. So it would be like actionskills.au, for example. Um, that is coming in the future, so keep an eye out for that. Um, now .org.au, I think if you're an organization, you should be using uh, or consider using a .org.au. I don't really like asn.au, it just doesn't quite work. Um, it's just sort of an Australian thing that doesn't make sense overseas. Now you need to be a registered organization um, and there's various um, meanings of that, you know, not for profit, an association, those sort of things. Um, and so you'll need those numbers when you register. And when you register, you also need to have a name that's similar to what you're registered as. Now you can register unrelated names if it's a campaign or something, but that just takes a few steps and it's a bit more complex. So you'll probably need to have to get tech support to help you with that versus just registering a domain. 
Um, now, Australian domains are all, uh, managed by an organisation called .auda. Um, that's their website there. So if you want all the information about the Australian namespace, that's there. And obviously every country has their own namespaces, except for the US. Now the United States sees that they're the center of the universe and the center of the world, and they have made themselves the center of the internet. So technically .net, .com and .org are actually American domain spaces. Um, however, that's just irrelevant as far as internet history's come now. So America doesn't actually have their own namespace but they, they have been introducing ones for like their government and their military and things like that. Uh, and also I've got some links here that you can follow, which are, um, which is like the official documentation from the uh, organization. Now the exciting thing is um, that's happened in the last few years is that we've got a whole new world of domains. The problem with .com is that they are getting registered uh, and also people who are buying and selling domains are registering them and they're really hard to get and hard to come by after a while. So they've opened up this whole world of domains. .aaa, .active, .aero. This is just in the A's, .allstate. Um, so basically the rules were uh, something like if you could prove you could run a registrar business, uh, you've got the business model. I think it was when it first came out, $80,000 a year in fees, and there were some other requirements. So you could just register your own .baby, for example. Uh, and I think, for example, .nike, um, Red Nike registered .nike, so then they could use that domain space for their, just their corporation. But because they're such a big corporation and branding so important to them, it was willing to do the fees and stuff. So that's really exciting for us because it means that we've got so many more options for choosing domains. The other um, thing that's good as well is in the old days, we used to, um, if we if we registered, say, the .com, we'd want to register the .org and the .net as well, so other people could use the space. Now there's so many domains, it's just impossible, so you can't stop people using the same name, so you just don't worry about that anymore. And here's another list as well, so um, .sydney, dot dev, dot, um, dot space, dot accountant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's, there's heaps and heaps of um, dot charity, maybe relevant to some organizations. There's dot green, dot eco, dot earth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so now we have a subdomain. Now subdomain is generally, if you control the domain name, so if you've registered actionskills.co, is what I've got up there, that means I, have, I can set up any subdomains that I want. So, and the way it will look is HTTPS subdomain.customname.com. So it's this, this bit at the start. So where that's useful is if I've got my, say I've got a shop at a different software on a different server, completely different part of the internet. So I could set up a subdomain shop.actionskills.co and then point the shop over there. And then I've got my website over there. And then I might say, oh, well, I want to have a, um, some sort of like forum and um, which is using a different software on a different server. So I could set up forum.actionskills.co and send it that way. So subdomains are really uh, useful for, for technically if you want different software or you want your software to be on different servers and different parts of the internet, they'll allow you to do that. Um, but generally, if, if it's the same sort of software, same sort of thing, you'd want to keep it at forward slash, so actionskills.co forward slash shop forward slash forum um, is, is better practice, but either or it's not really that much of an issue. Okay, so search engines. So a lot of our decision making is how does Google like this? And it's becoming less of an issue. Uh, Google um, used to, and I think it still does prioritize .com domains in search results. Uh, just It just had that bias programmed into it. This is becoming less of an issue. Um, and it's and if you did the search marketing webinar I did uh, recently, uh, all those other attributes actually mean more um, than the actual, if you're using a dot, um, you know, dot green or dot eco or dot earth um, domain. Now, if you, when we're talking about, we'll be talking about DNS a little later, but if you register your domain with Google um, using the DNS method, 
that means that it will automatically register all your subdomains as part of your whole website, as your whole website um, ecosystem, which is really handy because previously it used to treat subdomains as separate websites. So you can actually configure it now that all your subdomains are as one website. So choosing a domain is really, really important part of your branding. Um, to me, when I was setting up action skills, we did a lot of work um, figuring out what our domain was going to be. Um, as an internet-based company, I mean, that's our key marketing address. Um, however, whatever you're doing, I think it's really important to choosing a domain. So I'm going to go through some ways of approaching it. Now, this, these aren't rules. So these are things that you'll think about because some of these things are also contradictory as well. Um, so you've got to, you've got to, just got to you know, look at the ideas that I'm presenting and then go, what makes sense to me? Does that, does that make sense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, but I'll go through them. Be unique. This will this make sure that um, your social media names will be more likely to be available. Um, however, it's much easier to remember. So Action Skills is reasonably unique in the market. I'm yet to come across it out there. I mean, it, it is used here and there, but when I'm marketing in, in the Australian not-for-profit um, area, um, it, it's a unique name. So people hear it and they know it's us and then we can build up our brand. If we're using um, something like Common Ground, um, it's just used by heaps of different organisations and it can get really confusing. So being unique is, is quite an important attribute. Um, and what's happening in recent times, we're always now checking, are our socials available? So here's some tools that will help you. So you could type in um, action skill. I'm going to put action skill because the socials are going to be taken because I've registered them. And here we go. So it's saying the dot com's gone, the Facebook's gone, but the Twitter, you know, da da da. And here's another tool that will help you search for social media. So uh, we did how to choose your social media platforms in previous webinars. Um, generally, we we're looking for Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, YouTube, and a few others. So we wanted to make sure we could get that in our domain space. Um, now it's not a break. break in that context. So for example, with another brand I run, Flame Rider, I couldn't get the Facebook um, address. So then I used my web address, which is flamerider.art. And as far as our, um, the, the domain, I used .art because it's relevant to that brand. And then I could also then get the main word. Is it easier to remember and pronounce? So you want to imagine that you're in a radio interview and or podcast and and um the announcer goes okay that's so exciting what you're working on what's your web address and then if you have a web address like my past one which is device i then need to spell it dvize.com because it's spelled abstract so therefore it's wasting space on on the radio time but then it's also hard for people to remember so that was a bad domain in that context um, so you want it to be easy to pronounce on the radio and you want it to be able to be spelt easy. So someone will go, oh, I remember that website. Um, what was it? And then they can type it in and try and find you. Be short. I'm a huge fan of short um, domains. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One, it just looks good and it's, it looks professional. Um, also, um, with email. So if you've got a long domain and then you've got somebody that say maybe for, has a really long, long name, it means that their email address is massive. So by having a short email, it means that if people have long names, then that's less of an issue. Um, and also back to the spelling and pronunciation, it being short is um, a lot better. Now be descriptive. Um, so if appropriate, use words that represent what you do. So action skills, so we're, we're doing active and we're talking about skills, so that's descriptive in some ways. Uh, keywords, so Google, Google denies this. In all literature, Google says we don't rank higher um, um, websites with the keywords in the domain. However, from all the experience I've seen, um, I've seen really low optimized sites rank highly just because of the, the keywords in the domain. Um, and that could shift. So I wouldn't buy a domain just because it's got keywords in it. I mean, you're balancing all these things, right? So if you, um, by having keywords in it would be a bonus um, because in the short term, Google is gonna help you rank. And the other important thing is make sure your name can't be misinterpreted. So what I recommend is, um, 
contact some of your friends that are, um, you know, have a bit more of a dirty mind or an ab <laughs> abstract, inappropriate way of thinking and get them to check your stuff. Um, so these are two real life examples um, that were, uh, that happened in the past, um, experts exchange and the therapist finder. Um, but as you look at the domain, the way that they read there, um, that is actually not the intended um, result, uh, intended what they want so it's important to make sure that your domain can't be read in um you know abstract ways and in that context and some further tips .com is the most prestigious global domain um, but it's also um uh you know got a corporate or business edge to it so for a lot of not-for-profits they may not be appropriate um they're also hard to get especially a short one uh, a lot of them have already been registered by investment companies and so therefore will be expensive to buy it now, if you want to be registered as an Australian organisation, .com.au is the, is the best do domain because that really um, shows that you're Australian. If you're .org.au, then that brands you as an Australian. And this is really good when you're trying to build trust, say, for donations. If you've got a .org.au domain, then people already understand that it's an Australian organisation. It just gives that a little bit more trust when um, you know, you're registering um, to donate on your website. And it will also help with, you know, use various legals if you're trying to register your organization and that sort of stuff. And also, um, does your domain extension represent your brand? So I used the word flamewriter.art as an example just previously um, because it's an art website. So .art made sense. So um, pork bun is an interesting, it's a really good search engine. So we could um, just say we're going to go, we are, um, just say we're gonna be green our brand's going to be green we can go search and then this will search for all the um you know the subdomains and whether they're available so i'm not, not recommending um so much registering through this organization you may uh however they've got quite a good search engine and it's really um useful to just type in words and just go through and see what's appropriate dot academy dot baby dot band dot blue dot 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 heaps of things Okay, so now that we've um, chosen a domain, we want to work out how to register it. So registering is like buying it. So you need to go to an online company called a registrar, and they're a company that's licensed by the various um, authorities who control all the domains to sell. It's like a hot, they'll buy them wholesale and then they'll sell them retail. So all the different domains have different rules. So Australia domains have their own rules. And then because the new domain spaces are more loosely controlled, then they all have their own rules and subsets. So some, some of them are pretty strict. So if it's um, a specific domain, maybe I'm just say for an example, if it's not healthcare, maybe they might require that you have some sort of documentation that you actually healthcare. Some of them don't actually care. So .art, you can register that for whatever you want. Now, for you to find an accredited Australian registrar, so this is if you wanna register an Australian um, domain, then the, AUDA um, has, this is a list of all the companies that are, are able to resell um, Australian domains. Remember that a lot of companies resell services and resell services. So the company you're working, that you want to register in may not directly be on this list, but they may be a customer of TTP. So for example, Net Registry here on this list has been bought out by TTP, um, which has been bought out recently by somebody else. Um, to, to register and you just go to the, just go to the website you type in your domain hit buy whatever the process is if there's rules attached to it then you'll need to fill in the whatever rules the um you know if you're going for dot org day you need to put in your organization number and those sort of things um okay if you're registered with atsic you don't need another registrar okay so um, this is a different type of registration to ATSIC. So with ATSIC, you're registering your trading name, you would be registering your, your business organization, um, your business structure, that sort of thing. Now, in addition, now we're talking about registering your domain name. So it is a separate process. So um, with .com.au, you require an ABN. That's correct, Shay. Um, so in that context, you'd need to be registered by ATSIC to get your ABN, then you can then register your domain. Now, it gets a little vague with ABM with Australian domains though, because um, 
what happens is whenever I've registered a domain, I just put in whatever ABN, it doesn't cross reference it um, because it's all automated. What I've noticed recently when I've been registering.org.au is that I've been rejecting them if they're not an exact name match. Um, so if, if it's not an exact name match, but it's say a campaign that you're running, you may, may get rejected. So then you may need to then go to tech support until you can speak to a human and then they might go, yeah, sure, you have got to prove that that's your campaign and then you can go through that process. So don't um, try to register a domain the day before you launch a campaign. You want to register it way before. So if there's any issues with the registration process, then you've got a heap of time to go through the, the steps and hurdles to do that. Now, if you're registering one that has no rules, then you don't have to worry about it. .org, for example, you just go and register it, not a problem. Um, it's just the, the ones with the rules that are the issue. So you may want to um, choose to register, and we'll talk about hosting later. Um, you may want to register your domain with your hosting company. So there's pros and cons of that. And the, the, the pros of registering your domain with your hosting is that it's the same company. So it's simpler, you get one bill and same notification system. So or you've got to pay your bill, and, you, and that's a lot easier. Whereas if you have two different companies, you've got to pay attention to the two different companies. I, I, uh, for me personally, uh, I will register my domains independently from my hosting because, um, because um, if I want to change my hosting later, it, it does make more of an issue here and there. Um, because the ho your hosting needs could change. We're going to talk about hosting in a little bit. So in that context, I want to I might want to be able to change my hosting here and there. And so therefore, I keep my domains independent. So I just mentioned dodgy details like ABN can mean that your registration later gets taken down if a competitor complains. Um, yeah, that is, is correct. Um, but in some ways, in that context, would need to get legal support on that. The rules are getting a lot looser. Um, as we as things going, the Australians are realizing that it's the rules were too strict. Um, so it would be a case. So for example, I registered um, if I wanted to register actionskills.com.au, then I could say, well, it's well, I've actually registered as a trading name, so I can do that. But if I hadn't registered as a trading name, I can also argue that it's also a, a brand that I'm running. So yeah, that's that's a bit of a gray area. And if you're in doubt, and um, I recommend you get legal advice, or um, actually you could register as a trading name, and then you could get um, then get an ABM for the trading name, and then register it. Um, but with uh, Action Skills, we're using .co, so there's no rules for that, so we can it actually doesn't matter. Okay, so some important things to think about when you are registering your domain is that it's pub, there's public information. And so the public information about every domain is called a who is check. So this one here is a good, good one for searching um, non-Australian domains. This is the official Australian domain um, who is, and this one is in between. So let's just, um, let's just look at um, greenpeace.org.au. Okay, so, they don't have their phone, okay? So they don't have any details registered. Now, normally with a domain, that you'll have a name and address and phone number. So this is really important. Um, so for example, I was working with an organization and the, the person that was running the organization had a lot of friends and he had a few enemies. Now, when we looked at his the registration, I had his home address, and that's really bad. So we, we made sure that we changed the name of the home address. Um, and phone numbers are also interesting. Do, do you want that phone number public? So generally, um, the actual address and the phone number aren't used. It's, it's just the emails. So generally, I'm registering my stuff with an with a, um, expired or incorrect postal address and I'm using a since expired or incorrect phone number. That's because it's simply never used. And back to Shay's point, if um, someone's trying to take you down, then that may be an issue. Um, but generally I'll use that to obscure because I don't want, um, A, I don't want people call, like calling my number randomly, but I also don't more importantly want spammers to get my phone number. Um, and I definitely don't want my address up there. So any, any, so you do need to use correct email addresses and you'll have three contacts, a tech contact um, at admin and the, the billing. 
Now it's essential to have uh, live emails that you actually check because if there's an issue with the domain, you want to know about it. If it's going to expire, you want to know about it to re-register it and all those sort of things. Or if there's a dispute um, with the ABN and they'll notify you and then you can, you can sort that out. But those emails are public, so they are open for spammers. So there's two approaches to this. So I recommend that you um, use either an alternative email. So I've got domains at device.com set up. So that means just my domain stuff goes there. Um, and that way I, it's easy to filter, filter out the spam. You, you would not use just your standard email address. Um, and in that email address, you could then put a forwarder to your normal address if you want to do that. But just be aware that if you've got your email on that system, it will start getting spammed. However, you do need a proper email on there. Now there's another uh, approach that you can use and that's called privacy services. So a lot of uh, the registrars now are using, um, now using this, the, you can buy this service and what they do is they register under their name, their address, their phone number, and they keep your details um, private. So if privacy is an issue to you, if you're an individual, that's really important. Now for an organization like Greenpeace, which is why I checked it up, that looks a bit dodgy that they don't actually have their address because Greenpeace do actually have a corporate headquarters in Sydney. They do actually have a phone number. They do actually have contact details. So for me, why don't they have them on the who is registered? So if you want to appear legitimate and correct and proper, then you should have all your proper um, details. And, and if you do have a, um, an office, then that's public information on your website. Why don't you care that it's public information on your, on your domain records? Um, whereas in my case, I'm actually, you know, it's my home address and I don't actually want them to know. So you, you want to go through those issues. And the other thing to think about when you're going through your domain registration is ignore the upsells. So I'm talking specifically about a famous registrar called GoDaddy. Um, when you go to register a domain through them, they're a big reputable company and they're cheap. They try to upsell you with all these, these features, website builders, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So ignore all the upsells. What you want to buy is just the domain. And you may consider buying privacy. Um, now, you also may want to choose hosting. Now, you're going to choose hosting on its own merits. So we'll, we'll go through hosting later. So you may want to choose to go with that company, but you would have made that decision beforehand. You're not going to just buy a domain and go, oh, cheap hosting, and then buy that. And I've seen some people just get sucked into that. So just buy the domain and whatever services you want, but make sure you're not getting upsold. And check, uh, and if any, uh, some hosting companies and some domain companies offer free domains, and sometimes that's a really good value. So I just would urge you then to look in the fine print because sometimes a free domain means that they own it or it may be linked to the hosting. So if you say, oh, well, your hosting sucks, I'm gonna move. They're like, well, you can't because the domain's locked the hosting. So if there is any sort of free attachment to the domain, uh, if they're giving you a free domain, look at the fine print. So some companies will say it's free when you're on our host, but if you want to move host, then you've got to um, transfer the domain and they let you do that. And that's just the standard cost of transferring a domain. So that'd be fair use and I'd be happy with that. I'd go, yeah, thanks for the free domain because I know that if I want to change, then you're going to let me and then I can just transfer it um, versus if there's some fine print. Um, because if it's your domain and if this is your address, you don't want someone else to own it. That's really important. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk uh, about what is hosting. So we've talked here about the registrar and the domains so are in this box here. And then we're gonna talk about actual hosting. And what is hosting? So hosting is where your website lives on the internet. So most people don't actually know what the internet is. It's just this magic cloud, a bit like monkey magic that's flying around and serving our websites. So I'm gonna to talk to you um, in more of a layman's terms what hosting is. Now, I may get some of the terms technically slightly wrong, but that's more because I'm trying to simplify the, the overview just because you, you are not going to be doing advanced hosting stuff. So I'm just trying to simplify it so you can have a good understanding of what a host is. Uh, so basically, it's the actual computers and the software that run your website. So let's start with the machine. Now, this is a web server, and uh, it looks a little bit different to your laptop. However, it is exactly the same. Uh, the difference is there's the shape and the heat optimization and things like that. So your, if you've got a Mac or Windows or Linux, then it comes with software already built in that you can run a web server. 
So that means you can plug it into the internet and you can run your website from your um, laptop or your desktop. Um, so if you think of it as that, it's just a computer and I can just run my websites off it. Now that's not very good because the moment you turn off your um, computer means that the, your website goes down. So you'd never actually run a, a website off your la laptop. You, you may run it if you're developing or, or building a website, but you'd never run a live website off that. And some people, um, some companies, and this used to be common in the past, would run that, they'd have machines in their office that would actually run their website. However, that's really old fashioned because the hosts, and I'll move to the hosts, the data centers, um, have the, have a huge amount of services that help your website stay up and online. So this is a um, the computer's got processor, RAM, all those things. Now it doesn't have a keyboard or monitor because usually they, they access them by the network. And if a technician wants to um, look at this computer, they can just plug those things in. Um, so just think of it as this is this is your laptop without the screen and the keyboard. Um, that's the machine that your website's running on. And that's important when we're talking about resources a bit later to think of it as a computer. Data center. Now data center is, um, so basically those, those computers then go into a rack. So that's, that's a number of those, these computers up here in this rack. And then those racks then are piled up um, into these server racks. And a lot of the data centers in the US will be massive, like huge warehouses that are multi-levels. I mean, the scale of data centers, um, uh, some of the Google, Facebook, um, Amazon are just like massive, massive, um, so many computers. And the military, of course, are using massive data centers as well. So the thing that they have though, is they have actual physical security to stop you know, people breaking in. They have um, a lot of software security. They use, they'll have really fat internet connections coming in. So your website's fast. They'll have secondary and sometimes third, sometimes more internet connections in case they fail. They'll have backup power systems in case the power cuts. The uh, data centers use a lot of power. So they have a lot of environmental impacts. Um, and that's actually becoming a real big issue now is the, the amount of environmental impacts. They use a lot of power for the, for, to run the machines, but to cool the machines as well. So in the US, a lot of the big data centers are near big power sources, nuclear power plants or hydroelectricity. So they'll actually place them there. Um, and I saw a case where one of the big corporations built, um, bought an old alum, uh, aluminum refinery um, and cleaned up the site and then plugged it into their fat power supply because um, uh, refining aluminium requires a lot of power. Um, they also have things like if it catches on fire, then they, you've got 30 seconds to leave, they suck all the oxygen out, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, the, these are far better place for your website um, than sitting on your laptop. Um, and in the UK, they're putting them in old nuclear bunkers um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's visually what it looks like, just a computer with lots of computers and then lots and lots and lots and lots of computers. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about some different types of hosting. And this is really important as well for how you're gonna run your website. Now the first type of hosting is what we call software as a service. And in this context, you just don't have to worry about your hosting at all. So for example, your Facebook page is what we call software as a service. So that means that you can go to Facebook, add new page, and then it's done. You don't have to worry about hosting or software or anything like that. So if you had a Shopify website, if you had a Squarespace or a Wix website, um, all these sort of tools, um, you pay, you rent, or you get for free the software, but then you also get the hosting and all that. And you don't have to worry about it. So software as a service is the most easiest way approach because none of, none of the rest of this matters. Um, however, this, this talk is more for if you're gonna be running your own website. Um, but it's also interesting to understand this stuff if you, even if you are using software as a service. The most common um, shared uh, hosting for small business and for not-for-profits is shared hosting. And this is where the you, we get one machine, so one of these machines. Um, now this machine also comes with an operating system and, and the maintenance uh, of the operating system and then various levels of software that run the server. So I won't go into too much detail of that. Um, however, 
it's the machine plus the, the software that's specialized in serving websites and for optimizing and speeding up the serving of websites. So shared hosting means that you've got a company that will manage all the start all the software for you. You manage your own software, but they manage the hosting software. And, and they've got one machine and they divide that up with all their customers. So you might be 20 websites on one machine or there might be 200 websites on that one machine, for example. So, but that's the cheapest, most cost effective. And if you're starting out, then that's where you probably start because it's just cheaper. And as your website gets bigger and hopefully you have the problem where shared hosting is no longer big enough for you. We can talk about that later, um, but it's definitely the cheaper way. So reseller is the same as shared hosting, except for you get um, access to just more tools to manage multiple websites. Now this is good for like, uh, for I'm running my own websites. I'm running about six or seven websites of my own. So therefore I've got a reseller so I can, I've got a few more tools to manage those. So if you're just managing one or two websites, then that doesn't matter. But if you're managing a heap of websites, then reseller may be the way to go. Okay, managed hosting. And th this is referring to the next examples. And what, manage, what I mean by managed hosting is that a company or you hire a company, another external company will manage that software layer and manage and make sure the servers are running. So if the server breaks, then someone's going to there to fix it if, and to upgrade the software and to keep that software managed. Now, hosting is, is complex. So I recommend that you don't become a host. Just pay like $10 a month for shared hosting or, you know, the money it takes. Like just pay someone else to do it. It's, it's really, um, unless you're into hosting, in which case you wouldn't be at this webinar. Um, yep. Yeah, so you want managed hosting. And th this applies to all the next levels that I'm about to talk about. Okay. So once you've uh, out outgrown a, a shared hosting environment the next step usually is what we call a virtual private server and what that means is it's similar similar to uh, shared hosting except for they may they chop up the machine into various parts and so maybe there's there's 10 on the website and then they install the whole operating system and all of the software so instead of running one operating system with uh, 200 websites, they're running 10 operating systems for 10 websites, roughly. Now what that allows though, is a lot more customization. So uh, with shared hosting, they restrict a lot of things to keep the whole system happy. So with, um, v with a v VPS, then that means that you can um, do a lot more customizations. You can also control things like the process and the RAM and, and a few other things. Generally though, you also get a lot more resources, which is why you'd upgrade from that to the um, virtual private server. Now dedicated server is where you've got a whole machine to yourself. So that whole uh, machine runs your website. Um, so this is when you're getting to bigger websites at the moment. And if you're even bigger than that, you may get a few of those computers and, and put them together to make one big computer to run your website. So I, I'm not sure what Greenpeace is running, but I assume they'd be running um, that sort of system where they're running a few, few actual um, machines just for their one website. Um, now cloud hosting, this is a huge buzzword at the moment, um, but the whole idea of this is that you get um, heaps of computers, and you network them together to make one large supercomputer. So if we jump back to this picture here, if you imagine all those computers joined together to be one, one computer, um, that's what cloud hosting is. So in that co context, then what they do is then they virtualize back to small units. So you might say, I'm going to, I'm going to pay for three processors, this much RAM, I'm going to pay for this much data um, out of that. Now there's a lot of benefits over that. It means that if, if the actual, this machine starts smoking, and um, blows up, catches fire, or stops working for whatever reason. If your website's on that machine, your website will go down offline. Now the host will be doing a lot of maintenance and they'll be upgrading and they, they do everything to prevent that, but it is possible. If you've got a, a networked machine like this, if one machine goes out, then that just means that they upgrade across the whole system. Um, so they, they can just adapt to the whole system. So Amazon Web Server, I think Microsoft's called Azure, um, a, a cloud based systems. Now this is where it's sort of moving to. Um, and I see that's more of the future because it just it makes a lot more sense from a technical point of view. Uh, at the moment I've, I've got some websites sitting on AWS and it's, which is Amazon web server, um, which is still a bit complex to manage and still needs a bit of tech, but I, uh, but I am seeing some hosting companies that are now 
um, that are managing websites are now using um, the, the cloud-based systems. And I think the cloud-based systems are gonna get more simpler and they'll probably replace eventually the traditional hosting system. And co-locations um, probably beyond um, what we're doing with hosting at the moment. And that's where we just rent space for our own computer. So we buy a computer, we rent space for your own machine. Okay, moving along. So how do we choose a host? Now that's the technical background. Um, so there's a few things that you wanna think about when you're choosing a host. Support. Now support is expensive. So uh, so for, you, for a company to provide 24 hour support, they need staff for 24 hours. So do you actually need that much support? So support's a big part of what you're paying for. Um, the cheaper hosts have lower quality support, the expensive hosts have high quality. And if you're buying really corporate level, then it's really, really expensive, but then you get dedicated techs that are good at what they do, that sort of stuff. Um, but really um, nine to five office hours for phone support and after our ticket support should be enough um, for what you're doing. Um, you're gonna pay premium for high end um, service. Okay, so how much data can you store on your website? Um, so, you know, if your website's one gigabyte and your email's two gigabytes, so you're gonna need three gigabyte, but then you're gonna need room for your, data, your backups, that sort of stuff. Now data in Australia is expensive, so um, you may go with an American host, which are really cheap, or you may put your backup somewhere else. Scalability means that can they scale up if you get hit with big traffic? And there are other ways besides just your host to help with scalability. But if you're suddenly on TV and your traffic goes up, will your website go down because it can't handle the traffic? Uh, if you're running multiple domains, so if you've got a few different domains for a few different cam campaigns and a few different things you're doing, you don't want to pay for each domain to be on a website on, on your server. Now, if you've got um, heavily trafficked domains, then yes, you do want separate hosting for busy domains, but you might have a few campaign domains that are just not getting much traffic, but they're still important. So in which case you, you, to bring your cost down, you can put them all into one hosting account. But just remember each website has its own impacts and own resource impacts. So you want to make sure that, um, you're not putting high traffic websites in one account because you slow everything down. Uh, and resources. So what, what a, a normal scam in the hosting business is, is that they, they put you on, you sign up, they put you on a fast server, your website's going super fast and you're really happy. Then they keep selling and selling. So with, remember with the reseller, they're selling parts of that computer. And so you're, you're only on the web, you're on that server with five other people, and it's really fast. And then they've sold another 100 websites and now it's really slow. Now the main issues that we have here are what we call processor and RAM. So if you think about your computer and you're running 10 bits of software at once, your computer slows down, it can't handle it. That's exactly the same with a web server. It's exactly the same because it's the same type, it's a computer just the same. Um, so websites use processors, so that's how much um, stuff it can process, and RAM is how much memory it can put in for, for that processing. Um, so if your website is using um, various um, plugins or technology that's really processor and RAM heavy, then you're gonna need more resources. Um, or if other websites on that shared hosting environment are using heavy resources, it's gonna slow your website down. So resources are an important part of looking at um, some. And I'll, I'll, we'll look at some web companies next and have a look uh, to compare. Make sure you uh, Linux hosting, unless you've got a good reason not to use Linux, I recommend that you do. So the, the three main operating systems for computers are Linux, uh, Mac and Windows. Some people haven't heard of Linux, um, but it is the third one. Now with computers, the main ones are Linux and Windows. Now, there are, again, other flavors, um, but Linux is the far dominant one. Now, Linux is open source, so that means you're not paying fees on it, which is really important. Um, now, if you're using things like WordPress, WordPress sits on Linux, uh, is open source as well, so it works better on Linux. So unless you've got a reason not to use Linux, whatever software you're using, then I recommend using Linux. Location, if your audience is in Australia, then I recommend that you use an Australian hosting. That means you've got Australian business hours for support, it's your, your servers are physically closer to where um, where your audience are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, America is the cheapest in the world, um, generally. And if your website's global, then it makes sense to host in America because it's just cheaper. 
Um, and also, if, or if you've got a really low budget, then you can consider that. But there are Australian hosts which are, are quite cheap. And legals. So if your campaign is a little bit um, controversial, um, or maybe you're worried about legal action, or maybe you are actually courting legal action um, as part of your campaign strategy, then you might want to look at other places outside the Australian jurisdiction. So uh, if, if, you, if, if a, a lawyer sent a letter to the host, they may just take your website down. So you want to um, also consider that. So I'm just going to look at two companies, um, um, Servisaurus and Venture IP. So these are two companies that I'm recommending. Um, for right now, there's a lot of companies, um, so don't take this as, as gospel. Uh, and also your hosting recommendations are, I'm just gonna compare them just so you can get a bit of an idea. Um, now also cPanel, I'm gonna talk about cPanel in a bit. Ideally, you wanna have cPanel on your hosting uh, or equivalent tools. So here we go, $20 a month, you get two gig of disks, that's how much data that's your website, 100 gig of traffic. Now, most websites just don't go anywhere near their data traffic, so it's irrelevant. You can host multiple websites. Now you get one CPU, so that's your processor. They're not talking about RAM, so I don't know what, and all hosts should give you free SSL certificates. That helps you give the S in your domain that we heard about before. Venture IP, oh, the other thing with hosting is if you're going with an Australian company, make sure their data center is in Australia. Because a lot of um, Australian hosting companies will actually use data centers in America. All right, so this is, um, so for, for $9 a month, you get five gig. Um, also SSD storage, if you know about computers, um, also will speed up your website. Two gig memory allowance and 100% CPU. Now these are also by, um, vague figures. I had a friend that knows hosting a lot more than me, run through some maths with me the other day. And the CPU allowance is not actually full time. It's you get a certain amount of peaks and it's, the way they calculate it is a little bit um, dubious and um, not, not as would understand it. However, it does give you a very good um, range. So in this context, if we're paying $9 here for starter, we get two gig of memory and 100% uh, CPU, if we go to $20 a month, we actually get twice as fast computer to run our website on. So if your website's going slow, there's heaps of things to optimize it, but good hosting is, is, a, is a big part of that. So that'll give you a bit of an idea of um, you know, looking at a good host. Both these companies have good support. Um, both have got good reputations. Um, now Servisaurus, um, for the environmental people out there have got, um, they're the most sustainable one that I've found. Uh, 1%, the B Corp, they use green power, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend those two companies, but again, there's so many hosts out there and depending on your needs. Any questions so far? Oh, beautiful. All right, so I'm going to now talk about the basic tools. So when you, when you um, get your, when you've now signed up for your hosting, you will then get a management interface. The most common one is cPanel. There's another one called Plesk. Companies like SiteGround and DreamHost have their own panels. And what's happening is cPanel uh, had a monopoly or you know, market dominance. They last year changed their pricing models to be far more expensive. So a lot of web companies because hosting um, to be competitive on price have now been developing their own panels. But I'm just going to show you cPanel. Um, just so you can get an idea of that. Um, actually, I might, I might skip this one and I'll go through this after the break because I've got to log in um, while I'm sharing screen. I'm just gonna, I'll jump to the next, next um, component then we'll have a break, I'll log in and then we'll go through the C panel. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna talk about how to get your domain working with your website. So you've registered your domain, you've registered your hosting or you paid for your hosting. Now, how do you get it to work? Now, also remember most hosts will help you with this. So this bit may get a bit, bit technical. That's fine because you can get, your host will help you with that. Um, if assuming you got one with good service, but I'll, it's important for you to understand it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk back to, back to this picture here. Um, 
where did my uh, PDF go? Let me open it again. So back to this drawing here. Um, okay, so now we've registered a domain with a registrar, which is here, and, and we've bought our host. So now we need to delegate the, the domain. So the language is we need to delegate the DNS. And what that means is in English for normal people is we need to point the domain to the host because the two things are independent. So there's um, a system on the internet where when you um, delegate it, the details go, well, you type in the domain and then the browser goes, well, where's, this where's the website? And then it cross-references that and then it goes to the host. That's more complex than that, but that's all you really need to know. So you're pointing the, the, the domain to the host. And that is called delegation. Um, and to delegate your domain, you need to configure the DNS, the domain name server, the DNS, the domain name server. Now, when you register your, your host or when you, you pay for your host, they'll give you some DNS codes. Um, and if they don't, then you contact them, say you need, they need to give them to you. Uh, or they might help you set it up. And what the DNS codes will look like, will look like something like this. NS1, name server, stands for name server one dot your host dot com. Sometimes these are um, a bit gibberish. That doesn't matter. Like you just got to grab those codes. Now, the reason we have two, three or four is it's a redundant system. So if the NS1 fails, then it'll go to NS2. If that fails, it goes to NS3. So what we need is those codes. Now, then you go to your registrar. This is where you registered your domain. And in there, there'll be uh, somewhere in the interface where you put in the DNS codes. Now, I'm not gonna show you an exact example because all the registers are slightly different. Um, however, if you understand the language, you need to delegate the DNS, then there'll be somewhere in that interface where you do that, delegate the domain. They'll use these terms, these are the correct terms. Um, then you put in the three codes, hit save, and then they'll be done. Now, the important thing to understand about delegation is that it's not an instant system because the internet is decentralized. Um, and so I'll skip the, the, the details, but basically different parts of the internet do the same role and they've got to update each other. So if you register a domain um, in Australia and you're using Australian hosting and Telstra is connected to it, the Telstra node that points domains to hosts will actually update really quickly. So your domain may go live in an hour or two. However, your domain won't be live in, live in Russia or China or um, in America. It, it can take up to 48 hours for that DNS to propagate through the internet. So it's really important that you leave enough time to, for that process to happen. You also want to leave enough time in case you get it wrong and you need to fix it because then it's 48 hours to realize then another 48 hours. Are you going to know before 48 hours if you've got it wrong because it will update locally a lot quicker. So you're looking at eight hours locally would be, I'd be looking at it for problems at that point. Um, yeah. So then you, you've, you've delegated that. Okay. So this C panel is um, the most common. However, other companies may use a different panel. I mean, the software itself is not that important. It's more what you can do with it. So I'm going to run through some of the things that you want to do with the software. Um, so firstly, on the, on the right here, we've got some statistics. So this is how much disk I'm using. So I have a three gig allocation, so I'm not using much of it. That's great. Now, now, down here, I'm using zero CPU and zero um, memory. This is really good. I mean, it's bad because my website's not getting much traffic. Um, however, when this is maxing out, that means that it's going to slow your website down considerably. So, for example, if you're running lots of software on your website, I'm um, sorry, on your computer, and then uh, the processor can't keep up, what happens is... Oh, my chance to be dodged what happens is that then the, everything slows down and that's the same thing. So if these things are going uh, above to a hundred percent, that means your website's going to be slowing really uh, far, uh, slowing down substantially. Um, okay. So here uh, I have a backup system. 
So I won't go through that. Um, you know, limit. We've got limited time today. However, uh, it's really important that you you would explore how your backups work. This is databases. So for example, WordPress. If you're using WordPress, would require a database. Most software would. So this is where you can create databases. This is where you can manage the software. Um, so domains. So we went through domains earlier. So this is where you can create your subdomains. So you can jump into here, and then you can just go um, webinar, and then it will just magically make one. So uh, there you go. So it's been created. So now that that as simple as simple as that. Um, oh, where did I go? Okay. Um, you can also do add-on domains. So this is where I was discussing before, where if you wanted multiple domains on the one thing, you or on the one host, you may also have a domain where you're just not using at the moment, but you want it, still want to use it. So you can redirect it to your main website. So this is what your redirects will do here. Um, here's where you can set up email. So you can create email accounts. So for example, Glenn at actionskills.co can be created here. And there's a few uh, tools here to help you manage your email. Um, metrics. Now, this is your website statistics. So if you're using Google Analytics, for example, you'd switch these off. Now, some hosts have them switched on or off. So you need to check that if you do want to use these services or not, you need to check them. Um, so Webalyzer or Stats, the, and, and, uh, these are the equivalent to Google Analytics and they'll tell you what the traffic and um, various stats and stuff are. So if you've got privacy issues with Google Analytics, then you can actually just run it straight off your server. Now, now these, will, these will take up space on your server, so just bear that in mind, but it's not a lot of space um, and depends on how, how much um, hosting space you have. SSL, so this is where you can create your SSL certificates that we talked about before to, make, to um, create. So a lot of this stuff is just click click interface like with subdomains. So I won't go into too much detail, but generally this will allow people that aren't that techie to be able to do, um, you know, these sort of things. So it is quite um, simple. Now PHP um, settings, this is getting a little bit more advanced, but as you start fine tuning, if you're running WordPress, you need to fine tune um, the PHP settings. Um, so you might be having a problem, you search on, on the search engine, how to fix it, and they, they the solution is you need to adjust the PHP settings or some sort of settings, that's where you would do it. Um, and then um, what I don't have on this one, because I've, I have no need for it, um, however, most of them will have a, a software installer. So a WordPress installer, for example. Oh, they used to have it. Um, maybe I missed it, software. Oh, they don't actually have that plugged in. That's interesting. Um, so in that case, I can just click a button, I can install WordPress, I can install lots of other software. I'm gonna jump back to the cPanel when I'm talking about some other stuff, um, where I'm doing some more of the detailed stuff um, later on. Um, however, this is sort of just the basics of what you need to know. So you can set up domains, set up your, you know, see how your server and your data is going. You can also um, do you manage your backups, uh, your email, your domains, etc. Um, now, another interesting thing here is the disk usage. So we can load this in, um, and when it loads, I can scroll down here and go by disk usage. So I can actually see what is using the data on my website. So if you are, um, if you do have a lot of data and you're not sure, well, how come my website's so big? You can actually come in here and um, it will tell you where your data is. So sometimes there might be some really big pictures or big images or something like that. Now this is a bad example because I've got it such so optimized. But generally when I'm looking at um, people's websites, it's a mess in there and I can work out what the big, big files are and then we can try and um, clean them up. Okay, so that's the, the, the basic tools there. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to jump to email because email is a really important um, thing people do with their um, domains. And I'm going to explain uh, some different ways of approaching your email. So the first and most common way is that you host it with your website. So in that context, when I showed you the cPanel, 
it's exactly this. We can go to our um, email that's on our server here, um, create email accounts. That is the simplest because you delegate your domain to your host and then all your email, everything works. Um, now the, the, con of the, pro, the, the problem with this is though that the data of your email adds up to your data of your, of your whole website. So if you've got someone that's really piggy with their email and they've got one or two gigs worth of email, there'll be two gigs sitting on your server. So if you're paying $20 for five gigs and most of that's email, it's, it's quite, it becomes quite expensive way to host your email. Um, but it is simpler and easier to do it. So depending on what you're doing there. Um, then the, the next most common approach is to run an external email. Um, so this is where somebody else uh, manages your email. So the most common approach to that is Google. So you may have uh, your website hosted uh, on, a, on a standard host and then your email is on Gmail. You can pay a, a monthly fee per user to, have, to use your domain. So that means like glenn at actionskills.co. Uh, and if you go to Connecting Up, which I've uh, looked at, uh, which I've mentioned a few times in these webinars, connectingup.org.au, then, then you can register for the not-for-profit access to Google. And Google has huge discounts for uh, email services and, and of all their services. Now, I, I personally uh, avoid uh, Google simply because of their, um, their lack of privacy um, and their working with the big um governments and all that sort of stuff so i i assume that any gmail is just simply compromised i my hosting or uh, my sorry my email is set up on device is using proton mail so that's an encrypted email service from switzerland and i pay a monthly i pay a yearly fee to use device so my device domain is my device is hosted here on servosaurus and then my email is on Proton. So my email address gt at device.com is actually at Proton Mail. Um, actionskills.co, I'm using WordFence. Uh, it's, again, it's an encrypted service. Uh, it's not as, not as um, staunch, uh, as high-end as um, Proton, but it's also cheaper. So, and I'm looking at having multiple emails for uh, Action Skills, so cost is an issue. But the point is that we've got hosting here and we've got an email somewhere completely different. And then the third main approach to email is that your company or organization has an internal IT system. Um, you may remember Exchange, Microsoft Exchange from the old days. This system's getting phased out um, unless it's still being used in high security areas or um, in old fashioned um, IT systems. Um, but generally the, the hosted service is um, now taking over most um, applications. And because Microsoft and Google and the, the big tech companies are offering really cheap uh, approaches to big organizations such as universities and companies, then it just totally makes sense for, for these organizations. So and basically email is, you know, your name at your domain name. Um, now it's also interesting to think of the two ways that there's two different internet uh, email protocols. The old fashioned one is what we call pop. And what pop does is that you, you have an email client. So um, Thunderbird or mail on a Mac or um, Outlook if you're Windows based. And so that's your email client and then you download the email from the server to your client and then your email is now in your client. That is um, being phased out by another technology called IMAP. And what IMAP does is that the email stays at the server and then it talks to the client and the client makes a, may make a copy but it references the email on the server. Now that's far superior because you may be doing your email on your laptop, but then you want to check your email on your mobile phone. So by having it at the server, uh, it updates through whatever, you might do a bit of email on your phone or update to the server, then you open your laptop and then it's all updated. You do a bit more email on your laptop, it's all updated. You forget you're on someone else's computer, you can log in through the browser, that sort of thing. So IMAP's pretty um, ubiquitous now, however, just double check when you're setting up a system that it is IMAP because it's just a far a better approach. Okay, setting up your email. So that um, we're gonna talk a little bit, we're gonna get really complex, we're gonna talk about name records. 
and um, this, and I'll run through that with name records. So if your if your email is with your host, so the first example I showed you here, then you don't need to do anything. You've you've already if you've delegated your domain, you paid for your domain, you've delegated, it, you paid for your hosting, then your email just works just magically, and it's great. Uh, if you want to set up your email to run to Proton Mail or Gmail or some other system, then we'll need to to talk about name service. And I'm going to do that in a little bit. Ah, here we go, DNS name records. Okay, so I'm going to talk about it now. This is going to get a little bit more advanced. Um, so you may be you may ask your host or to help you with this, um, but I th still think it's important for you to still understand the system. So a DNS, a dynamic name server, controls the domain. Now there's a set of records that sit under that, which are called your name records. Um, and there's a few categories of those. And those name records manage uh, various parts of what you can do with your domain. So one thing that um, you can do is you can use MX records, which manage your email. So if you want to have your email at Google and your website at Servosaurus, for example, then you'll need to then put custom MX records to point to Google. Now, Google's documentation is really good and really clear and step by step, so uh, lame people can can um, manage it. Uh, so that's why I want to run this through you with this. Just it seems a bit scary now because we're getting really technical, but uh, if you just go step by step, then it is actually doable. Um, the other thing that you can do is register your email for spam filters. So for example, uh, I'm using SendGrid by Action Network, my CRM, that's a lot of jargon for you, um, to send emails for these webinars. So to, to translate that to English, I'm using an external software uh, to manage emails and to send email. And then that software uses another bit of software to send the emails. So what I've done is I've registered my email with that software, with the people that send my email. And so what happens then when um, other email servers like Gmail and Proton, when they're checking for spam, they'll check my email registration. And because my email has been registered, it, they flag it as this is a really trusted email and it's going to go through the spam filters. This is, um, wasn't needed so much in the past, but in, even in the last six months, the spam filters got really um, tight. So we're needing to do that. So I can do that using my name records. Um, I won't go through that in this webinar, but just so you can understand that these are the magic things you can do with your name records. When you register with Google um, for search optimization, um, you can uh, you need to register that you own your website with Google so that um, they can start tracking tracking it, your webmaster tools, your analytics, that sort of things. So you can register using name records and what they'll do is it will register all your subdomains automatically as one uh, website for search reasons. And there's a lot of benefits for that if you're running multiple subdomains and so you might have shop.domain, shop main website, you might have a few different things, but you still want them all optimized as one website. And the other thing you can do is you can redirect subdomains. So if you've got if shop.yourdomain.com and you've got shop uh, Shopify over here and you've got WordPress here, you can use the name records to um, delegate the subdomain to somewhere else. So that's really useful that you can um, shoot your subdomains uh, all over the place. So I'm just going to uh, quickly just show you that. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it is getting quite uh, um, techy, but we go to domains, zone editor. So you've got DNS there. And then I'm going to go manage. And they sort of look like this. Um, and so I'm just going to jump MX is your email records. So in this context, I've got mine set to MailFence. So these were, when I set up MailFence, they had really clear step by step instructions on how to do this. So that's why I'm showing you this interface now. So the, the, when you go to door, the, the usually is really quite clear instructions, but you still need to understand what a name server is and DNS is. So hopefully you'll know that by the end of this moment. So this is the setup for this one. Um, so if it was Google, for example, they would send you certain codes to put in there. Um, the SendGrid ones. Um, so they, these domain keys here, SendGrid, these ones here are what I'm doing to register my email to be trusted to get through spam filters. Um, this is my uh, Google site verification that I talked about before. 
Uh, and again, when I, when I was registering for Google, there's very clear instructions. They go create this record and they'll exactly say, hey, exactly what details you need to put in. So you just come up to here and go add record. Um, so yes, we are a bit complex here, but if you break the complexity down, it can, it is reasonably simple. Um, and what else do we have in here? And this is also to um, verify my email that it's um, uh, trusted. This one here gives me errors. If that configuration is wrong, it will email me errors to my email address. So I'm troubleshooting them at the moment. Um, and this is the subdomain here. So webinar.actionskills.co and that's pointing to the same server. Uh, that's the one I just created then um, in, the, in the workshop. However, I can then redirect that to somewhere else. All right, so I'll leave it at that. Um, however, that's where you go if you want to set up your name service. Okay. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit. I don't have this one um, uh, expanded. I just put this in um, this afternoon before the webinar. And that's mainly because the this is a, a lot more of a, an approach that we're doing a lot with webinars. And I'll just explain um, what these two things are. Um, caching um, is a really important part of website optimization. So what happens when you go visit this website, this, this page, this is working on WordPress. So basically the, the first um, file that it hits will talk about security and then it'll jump to the, the next one that's defined. So then that file then um, starts running the software and the software goes, hey, we're gonna talk to the database. So it talks to the database and then, and then the database goes, oh, I need a, um, we've got all these plugins, so we're gonna get them running. And then the plugins go, well, I need this stuff from the database. And then um, it goes, oh, we need, we, we, we build the web page, then we need the template, we piece it all together, and then we shoot you the web page. Now, it's a bit more technical than that, but that's generally, it's building each web page live. And if you've got a thousand people building the web page all at the same time, your server will then slow down and your website slows down. So what we do is we put a cache in, and what a cache does is a cache makes a copy, so so it does all the things, and then it, it grabs the end web page, and then it makes a copy of it, and then it just serves that copy. So it stops stops your processor from having to, to think about it. So your processor, so when we looked at my stats for my processor, you saw that it was on zero. Um, that's because of low traffic, but it also means the cache is actually stopping that serve from doing any work. So caching is key part of optimizing websites. And there's three sort of approaches to caching. The first one is where we, um, maybe I'll stop sharing the screen. Um, so the first approach is that we cache on the software level. So with WordPress, we'd use software like WP Fastest Cache, and that uses that will compress the, web, the WordPress and do all that work uh, and does a lot of other optimization. The next level is a technology called Lightspeed or related technologies. So this uh, is also a WordPress plugin, but it sits on the server. And this is far more superior way of caching as far as speed optimization, because I've been doing a lot of work on this recently, um, on then uh, software-based caching. Then a third um, way of caching it is actually using an external service altogether. So that's another website that's going to cache it. Now, a common one of uh, caching software is called Cloudflare. And Cloudflare means that you then need to delegate your DNS to Cloudflare. So your domain points to Cloudflare. And then, then you set the, uh, the name service to, to, for it to go all the, all the bits. So that's why we went through that earlier. Um, and so what happens is that then Cloudflare will go to your website, grab a copy of it, and then um, cache it. Now, this has a, f a lot of um, performance benefits. Um, caching uh, is one of them, but it also puts a really good security layer. So that means if people are trying to hack your website, they don't know where your website is because it's actually everything's pointing at Cloudflare. So they need to hack Cloudflare before they can get to your server unless they know where, know where it is on the internet. So that's really, really useful. Um, and Cloudflare is like massive um, battle hardened um, machine. So to hack Cloudflare, you're, you're a pretty good hacker at that point. And you know, you're the innocent party in this case. Uh, the other thing that Cloudflare does is they've got data centers all around the world. So they'll actually feed your website locally. 
So if your website is hosted, if you're with Servosaurus, then you're physically located in Melbourne. If someone in, in London is looking at your website, they will be loading that website from Melbourne. Now, if you're with Cloudflare, then they'll load that from Cloudflare's London office. And so it'll be much faster. So that you have that benefit, um, which is really um, helpful. So in that context, um, and also Cloudflare is useful if you're doing more, con um, more controversial stuff. So when we ran um, Closed Pine Gap website, we were worried about it being, um, you know, targeted by various uh, military. So we uh, put it on Cloudflare um, as a security precaution. And when we looked at the Greenpeace website earlier, they were also running Cloudflare. Now there are other um, alternatives to Cloudflare, but that's the, uh, um, the concept. Um, and the other um, um, thing I've got written there is a CDN. Now this is called a content distribution network. <laughs> Apologies, content distribution network. So it, it does a few things. It acts as a cache for your content. So your content as your pictures, your movies, your um, PDFs, that sort of stuff. So what it does is it will grab your content and put it somewhere else. Um, and so it'll do similar things to what Cloudflare is doing is it'll locate them close to the where, you, where your, um, your audience is. But it does another thing. Your, your um, browser will only download a certain amount of files from one server or your server can only host, serve a certain amount of files at once. So if your website's got lots of pictures, lots of CS scripts, got fonts, got lots of stuff, what will happen is it'll load, um, start loading some files, then it'll load some more files, then it'll load some more files, which slows your website. Content Delivery Network will allow it to um, download them parallel. So you'll be downloading some stuff from this server, some stuff from this server, and it increases the speed of your website. So these are two advanced techniques to um, really increase the speed, performance, and also security of your website. So that's um, caching and content delivery networks. Okay, so let's see where we're heading to next. We're getting through this ladder bit a bit more. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about disaster planning. And um, I'm a big fan of disaster planning because what happens when there's a disaster, people freak out and get really stressed. And um, if you've done your planning, then you're not gonna be stressed. And it is, I think it's really important to be going through this process while we're all chill and happy, uh, rather than when your website's down or there's offensive imagery on it. And um, you know, everyone's getting really stressed. You, what's wrong with our website? So this is um, a disaster plan I prepared for an organization uh, about two weeks ago. And I've just taken, I've just um, taken out some um, personal details. Um, now your disaster planning will be different to this because depending on your specific setup. However, um, this will give you an idea of what I'm doing for a disaster plan. This is what I was sent to a, to a client or an organization that I'm working with. So the first thing we want to know, well, we want to document all the things that are managing our website. So uh, we can then give it to the client. So, so this is the example. So they're hosted with Servosaurus. And uh, this is where we go. Um, so if Servosaurus has got any problems, if we go to this website, um, it will say if there's any issues. Now, depending on what we're seeing when we get there, um, so this, this system's all up and running, that's great. Now, another thing that can happen is your host can block you or may block somebody. So if they think you're suspicious, they just give you a firewall block. Um, and so then you can come here and it'll actually say if you're um, blocked by the firewall or it can also have different IP addresses. So if, if one individual can't access the website or you can't access the website, but everyone else can, then it could be your firewall block. Um, now, it's important to understand what your host support terms are. So if you're not happy with their support terms, then you find another host. It's far better to explore this conversation now than it is later when you're trying to ring up support. So for example, we've got service sources um, support um, terms there. They offer nine to five Monday to Friday phone support, and then they offer 24 hours ticket support. However, they're a Melbourne based small company. They've got only a handful of techs. So they will be slow at three o'clock in the morning on Saturday night. That's just 
the nature of what we're doing here. If you want 24 hour rapid response um, support, then you need to go with a company that provides that, but that's gonna be very expensive and you have to show the money. Um, now what we've got here is also the people authorized to contact um, Servosaurus. So if you're not on that list and you need to contact them, you're like, I need to find someone who is. So if you're, you're the person that you think will need to contact the host in an emergency, you need to be on that list. So again, here we go. Here's where you can go to add more contacts. Um, and I've got a direct link to that. Um, okay, so in the, this is a Pacific a WordPress install. So I'm making it very clear that we don't offer emergency support, um, no matter how urgent. That's simply because my business isn't set up to, to handle support. Um, WordPress support's very expensive if you actually want proper WordPress support. Um, and it's really only appropriate for like enterprise, um, high traffic, high, high um, websites that are making a lot of money. Um, now in that case, if I'm available, I'm saying it here, if I'm available, I help, but you know, I might be out in the bush building sculpture or just camping or doing something. So um, I'll try and help, but if you, I'm not emergency. And uh, here's my email address to contact me and I'll, I'll give you a hand. Maintenance, it's really important to keep your systems maintained. Um, and I'll go through this a bit more in the, in the WordPress webinars later. However, I'm explaining, I'm updating them for them um, so they don't have to worry about it. And this is the time when we're doing it. Um, backups. So there's, there's two ways that we're doing backups. One is using a tool and I'm explaining how to use the backups, um, how to do backups. Um, and in this case, they would only do backup when they've done major work on the site because the secondary way we're doing backups is on the, on the host. And I showed you that earlier. We had the, the um, jet backpack, um, jet backup system. So that's running four snapshots a day. Um, so it's backing up four times a day. So um, that's a secondary system. And then we'll use, now the important thing about backups is never trust your host. So you always want your own backups. And so we're using Backup Buddy just for, if I've just done six hours work on the site, then I want to um, back that work up. But I don't need to back, back it up regularly if no work's been done on the website. So this is, this is our approach for this website. Security, um, I've, insecure, I've, put, I've got pretty heavy security on the website. Now we want to ensure everyone understands basic digital security. I'll be doing workshops, webinars on security later. Um, but they must understand basic security and they must understand how to have a basic password. Every, their team must agree to this and follow those rules. Um, the most, there's two main reasons WordPress gets hacked. Not updating software and, and uh, weak passwords. 98% of hacks are that. Um, so yeah, they're the two things we really... Um, now in an emergency, so I've got a protocol what to do in an emergency. First one is don't freak out because we've got a disaster plan here. We know what to do. <laughs> um, clear all the caches. So depending on what's wrong. So if you can actually access the back end, um, this is WordPress in this case, and it, the layout's just messy, then clear all the caches. Now caches um, give you those massive benefits I discussed earlier of speed optimization, but they can also break things. Like if they're compressing JavaScripts, for example. Now if something's been updated, and the cache doesn't update or gets a bit weird, it, it can then cause issues. So first thing you do is just flush all the caches out just to make sure that it's the, a new version being generated. Uh, okay, so that's still not fixed the problem. Let's go check Statusaurus, which I just saw, um, which I just showed you. Now, depending on your host, I have a different system. If that's still not working, um, contact the host and see if there's, I mean, if it's completely gone, see if um, there's issues with the hosting environment that not on Statusaurus. Uh, if they won't answer the phone during business hours, that's probably means I've got a problem as well. Now, if your website's been hacked, and it, it might be obvious that it's been hacked, maybe someone's written a website owned by, you know, hackers.com or whatever, um, or there may be other things you can see that it's obvious it's been hacked. Um, then what you do is you roll back to a version before the hack. Then, um, then update all the software and change all the passwords, because they probably hacked it with bad software and bad passwords. Now, if you ask how they hacked, doing um, digital, um, like working out how someone hacked is really expensive process. So it's something that we just don't usually do. We still guess how they hacked. Um, it's, yeah, it's quite an expensive process to, to um, get the experts to audit your website.
to see how they got in. Um, okay, so backup buddy won't work. Then use Jet Backpack, which is on this host. Um, if that doesn't work, then you could ask us if we're available to do a backup buddy rollback, or you can contact the host to do a rollback. Uh, then you log in and upgrade WordPress to the themes, change the passwords. Send us the password, contact us if problems persist. And if we think that it's not being cleared up, then we will um, quote you to clean it up or we'll um, use external service. And there's also these two tools which you can put your website address and it'll just keep pinging that server and it'll, it'll email you if your website's down. So if you've, if you've um, well, that's just good to have anyway, just to keep make sure your, your host is doing their job. Uh, but also if your website's having problems, then you definitely want to be notified of anything. So this is just a example of a um, disaster plan. So you want to put something together like this for your website. Um, and this process usually goes, oh, but our backup system, how does that work? And so you usually, you'll come to hurdles doing this process. And then while everything's calm and everyone's happy, you can then fix those issues. Um, make resolves, discuss things about support, those sort of things. You can ask the questions. And then in an emergency, then you just follow the protocol. Um, okay, any questions with that? Okay, so now I'm just going to now um, for the last bit talk about two advanced topics. And this is if you're wanting to start editing um, websites or start playing with the code. So the standard um, approach for this is um, if you're say running a web website and you want to edit the themes you want to maybe change the look and feel of the website um, or you know start actually editing the website itself so i'm just going to um, talk a little bit about that so there's two ways of approaching it um, and the first way so the scenario here i'm going to show you is that i want to edit the, the wordpress theme i want to change the colors of the um, style sheet so I use a technology called file transfer protocol. And um, so basically your website is hosted somewhere. In my case, it's Melbourne. And I'm here in, in a different suburb in Melbourne. So I have some software that then connects from here to there. So I'm gonna just show you an example of that. Um, and where is my, there it is. So I'm using Transmit, which is um, a licensed software. Um, but that's just because um, I use FTP a lot. And so therefore, you know, I've paid for an extra. So there we go, there's the webinar um, one that I did. So this um, now has accessed the files on the server. So I've now logged in. This is my WordPress. Um, this is my index.php, um, et cetera, et cetera. So then I can navigate to the various parts of my website. Now I'm not gonna go into detail here because this is more of a basic introduction. But I did want to introduce to you what FTP was. So if you did want to say, hey, I want to, I, I, I need to access a certain file um, to fix a bug or to make something better, or, or you might get the, the um, might start getting it confident and you want to start tinkering with your website, which is always good. Like this is the first step. And also if we jump back to our C panel, we also have FTP in the format of here. Here we go, there's my website and here's my, um, there you go, the webinar thing I just created. Public and there's all my files there. So you can also access it through here. Now I um, I will usually jump into here when I'm doing something really quick because it's just quicker. Um, however, it is, um, it's slower to work on. Uh, and so using a dedicated FTP software is, is far better approach. Um, now, if you want free software, I'm always a fan of free. Um, Cyberduck is a free version for Mac and PC, and FileZilla is a free version for PC, Mac, and Linux. Now, FileZilla is a really old school interface and a bit clunky, but it, it works well. Um, yeah, so you can do your research and see if there's any more, more modern versions of software that you may want to want to use. Okay, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about code editors. And um, so say you're on the website and you are um, now wanting to um, edit some stuff. It's really important that you use software that's designed for code. Now, if you use Microsoft Word, for example, Microsoft Word's got a lot of stuff built into it to style things. So fonts and colors and that sort of stuff. So it's actually, you can't actually see it looking at a, a Word document 
However, there's many layers of different languages that it's using. It's using the basic ATSIC uh, language for the text, but then it's using its own um, language to, to control the fonts and the colors and all that stuff. So there's actually a lot of uh, different languages there. Now, if you edit um, your code in Word, it may, and it, it likely will put some of that code in there or put, put some of that um, different languages in there. And then that'll just corrupt the original language that you're trying to edit. Um, and even uh, Dreamweaver used to do that, which is an actual code editor. Um, so it's important if you're working on servers and code that you use software that has no formatting. Okay, so the one that I'm using, and you would have seen it on my introduction, is Text Wrangler. This, there's two versions of this. Uh, sorry, this is BB Edit, sorry, I need to update that. Um, BB Edit, um, this has a free and a paid version. And this has no formatting. Um, and so this is what I use to edit files. I'm using other software as well, um, paid software to do various things. I've got a CSS editor, for example. Um, and this one for PC is Notepad++. Um, which you can uh, link through and that will allow you to also edit on um, a PC as well. It's also useful um, when we went through search marketing uh, webinar when we uh, I, I discussed semantic markup and writing for search engines. I do more of my content actually in a text editor. Even though I'm a graphic designer by trade, I just formatting distracts me. Um, so what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll do like that for a heading and bulleted list, I'll do that. And that's all the formatting I'm doing. Because with semantic markup, um, if you're at that webinar, is we're really simplifying our formatting. And so by just using a software that doesn't have formatting, it forces you to, um, to be clear with that. And then when you paste it into say WordPress or some other software, then you can do the formatting there. Um, so I'll leave it at that as well with the text editors. I just wanted to introduce that concept as well. So if you're getting your hand, pulling your sleeves up and going, you want to jump into the code, um, make sure that you're using um, similar uh, software. And uh, also on your, um, if we come to our cPanel. Now, .ht access is an important file for web servers. So I can come in here and I can edit. And so this question asking about the encoding, that is actually the language set that the, the utf.h, this, this is for simple text. This is a really weird thing that a lot of people don't understand. These are different versions of, of language just for simple text without formatting. So then when I'm talking about say something like Word, which has um, a, a format for language, for the, just the text and then languages on top of it. So we're gonna use this language. This is the one that's usually used. This is just for basic text. Um, and then I can hit edit. And then it's got an editor here. Um, and so I can edit the, the code there. Um, this is a clunky way of doing it. Um, however, if you're doing something quick, it's, it's really a good way of jumping in there. So that well, that's for me wrapping up the um, content. Uh, do we have any questions uh, about any of the geekery that we went through? And is everyone feeling confident that they can set up their own domains and, and play with the hosts and stuff like that? Okay, so um, I'm running these webinars as pay what you feel and I've got the donate link on the email um, that I've sent out through to you and on all the webinars as well. Um, if that's if that's not um, working for you, then I would really appreciate if you um, share my stuff, comment or like stuff because um, that also helps me get the word out there and helps me to, to run these things. Um, and that then allows me to keep producing free content for not-for-profits and supporting um, that side of things.